We so opinionated, seven footers who made it, block shots, dunk on some of the greatest. P Town and Carolina in touch with the latest. Posting up on the topics, ain't no way you can stop this. Hollins and Haywood, post off the pivot, living life to live it, tie a suit to fit it. Cash up, mash up, now we hook, skid it. Stadium to the set, we the litters. And the biggest. <laughs> We're here today, we have an incredible guest, one of the best ever do it in the NBA 17 year NBA 17 year coaching career I think he's the top b-ball analyst in the game right now let's give it up for Jeff Van Gundy I appreciate it guys how are you guys today hey, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm doing good coach I do I told you I had a bone to pick with you earlier I gotta just put it out here man we were playing the Lakers and I beat Dwight Howard to a spot Dwight Howard runs me over, and you go ham. And he, Hollins needs to be fined. There's no place for that in the game. He's flopping. Man, if I didn't get a damn call from the NBA the next day, <laughs> coach, I said, Coach, if you can mess with anything, don't mess with the money, man. I'll, I'll make it enough, coach. Come on, man. <laughs> well, I'm going to say you hit me where uh, I shouldn't ever mess with something. Mark Jackson always says that to me don't ever mess with another man's money. So, <laughs> I, I'll, 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 I'll take my um, uh, flogging for that. But the actual flopping, like, <laughs> I, I don't remember the exact play. But, man, I, I absolutely I, – I cannot believe where our game has gone today with flopping. Like, verbal flopping. Everybody who drives to the basket screaming out. <laughs> like, it, it, it just is – I don't know about you guys. It just irritates me. It irritates me to watch it. And, and then it's called gamemanship. You know, I think it makes our referees look bad. I think it makes our game look awful. And uh, I'm sorry I cost you a little money if it, if it did. Uh, it should have been taken out of Dwight Howard. He's made enough. He could have donated to the cause. So, um, but I hate flopping, man. I just, oh, it's the worst. I, th I think we smacked the Lakers by 20 they're on, on national TV. It was, it was okay, though, Coach. It was okay, Coach. <laughs> hey, stop. You want a team that beat the Lakers by 20? Yeah, man, we handle Kobe and them boys, man. That, 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 okay. Hey, 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 coach. Hey, Jeff, that, that, uh, that Steve Nash era, the white hair didn't go too well, man. Live City was okay. popping. We just didn't pop off in the playoffs, man. We <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what, it, it is interesting, right? The Lakers have been known for all the success, but everybody forgets uh, in that period of time where uh, before they got Pau Gasol back, you know, in that trade, you know, they were hovering in that, you know, 40 plus, you know, like 500, a little bit above. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard. You guys know, like, this is what irritates me, like, about when we, when the media in general actually make it look or sound like it's easy to play well and it's easy right. to win. And this is where, like, I think players who now have used their voice to defend themselves they back down a lot of the media. The media is mm. in this era is very, very montane compared to what it used to be. Um, but, but I'm glad because I, I think in some ways we, we all forget um, how hard it is to play well, how good the other guys are. And then we, we say like it, everybody should win. And it's just not that way. It's you guys know, you guys were on good teams, bad teams. Man. And in between. <laughs> it's hard to win a game, let alone, win it uh, win big or win a championship and coach you're talking about winning games obviously you won a lot of games in your coaching career but I want to understand how did your coaching career get started because you know a lot of guys get into coaching because they played a long time and then they moved up the bench that wasn't you 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 and your brother y'all didn't really have the, the, M the NBA physiques to play a long time in the league so <laughs> how did you how did you guys both both of you guys coming up players end up turning into great NBA coaches. Man, you, you didn't watch my games at Nazareth back in the 80s? Come on, man. <laughs> hey, hey, coach, I, I'm old, but I ain't that old. <laughs> I got double figures, I think, three times in my uh, college career. No, I think, you know, we were fortunate. We came up in a coaching family. My dad was a, a longtime small college coach, Division three JUCO. And then, you know, I got a break. Uh, I was a high school coach my first year out of college. And I coached a, you know, a really you know, a great player. He's a sophomore at the time. He ended up going to Villanova. So I had some coaches who came through to evaluate him. And fortunately, um, th from that, I got a graduate assistant job at Providence with Rick Pitino. And uh, 
we went to the final four my my first year there and then he went on to the Knicks and one of his assistants Stu Jackson took over for uh coach Patino when coach Patino left to Kentucky and I got in to the NBA at a young age I think I was 26 or 27 yeah. and I was able to hang in New York for 13 years uh working for Stu Jackson John McLeod Pat Absolutely. Riley so I had uh, a great uh, mentor, great mentors learning the game. And then my brother broke in uh, when Coach Riley went to Miami. Uh, Coach Riley hired my brother. So uh, we were really fortunate. Uh, there's a lot of really good basketball minds at all different levels. To think that we have the best coaches in the NBA um, would be naive. There's great coaches at all levels and if given the opportunity, could have certainly done uh, a, a very, very good job. Coach, I want to dive into New York basketball, man, because we're seeing something right now reminiscent of, of, of what you gave me, myself and Brendan, man, some great uh, New York memories. You know, I've always felt like when L.A. is good, the Lakers are good, it's good for the league. When New York is good, it's good for the league. And the last thing I remember mainly about the culture that you guys had set in New York was that it wasn't a championship but New York competed. They were excited. You had athletes who had players. They just got, I, I mean, shoot, I was a kid in the bar with my uncle when, uh, when, when, when you guys got it on with the Miami Heat and got just start script. Listen, man. The time old, out, time that, out, time was, out. You were a kid in a bar? Yeah, I was just going well, to go. Was, uh, it wasn't quite a what, bar. Whoa, 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 whoa. What in the name of bad parenting is going on here? Is there, it, is, is there a time stamp on, on calling CPS? Because somebody should have had CPS no, call. Well, it wasn't quite like a bar, Coach B. It, like, it was like, you know, during the day, I came in like, it's like going into Hooters, man. You go to Hooters to eat during the day, man. It's not, I'm, in, I'm not at the strip club, man. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Coach. I got, side, I got sidetracked by the bar story. Maybe <laughs> it wasn't quite a bar, Coach, but there was drinking going on. Not at the time that I was there. It was it was the daytime, man, but. I never forget where I was when you guys start scrapping with my with Miami. Okay, I'm, I'm not going there. But nonetheless, the point is the culture of New York basketball. How was it? What was it like competing year after year? The expectation I hadn't seen that in New York now, and I think that New York is trending back to a place that I remember reminiscent of that I grew up knowing and seeing. Coach, and you were such an integral part of it. Even though I know you're so humble, you're not going to take any credit for it, but you were a huge part of it. What was that like, Coach? Well, I think you know. New York uh, playing for the Knicks isn't for every player and it isn't for every personality type. There mm -hmm. have, you have to have uh, a pretty thick skin if you're going to be the best player on a New York Knick or New York Yankee team. You can't just um, think you're going to go unscathed when you don't uh, get over the finish line. And so we were fortunate um, from the time I came there, we had Patrick Ewing. And just a great player, but also if you're going to have a best player set a tone for your team, he was, he wasn't vocal by nature, but he, he worked um, like a champion. He competed like a champion and he played like a champion. And so everybody sort of fell in the line and because you could coach him, then everybody else was much more coachable. And so we had great, I mean, listen, I can't overstate the quality of our players. Um, now, the one thing we lacked, and I think it was probably the biggest reason why we weren't able to get over the hump, we didn't have a guy who could go get his own shot off the dribble. Um, uh, when you're trying to play through the post late in games, you guys know this, it's brutal down there. They're not protecting bigs like they protect, um, you know, smaller players. And so uh, we didn't have that until Patrick was out of his prime. When we got Allen Houston yeah. uh, and, and Latrell Sprewell, who could go and get their own. But then we became, you know, older and more injured. And, you know, there were problems with that, too. Uh, but you're right. New York, playing for the New York Knicks, coaching uh, in Madison Square Garden, there's nothing like it in the league. Uh, the expectations are high, but the rewards are high, too, because, it's a it's a really special fan base, and uh, man, to have been able to spend 13 years there as uh, six and a half as an assistant and six and a half as a head coach, I was more than blessed. 
And coach, um, I I wasn't in a bar growing up watching you guys play. But, <laughs> but the New York Knicks were my favorite team growing up. I was a Patrick Ewing, John Starks fan. Those were my two favorite players. I had a chance to actually be coached by Patrick for several seasons. It, it, he's he's a better person than he is a basketball player. One of the most humble superstars I've ever been around. But can you give me a behind the scenes story of when you really knew about Patrick's greatness or something that he did that just stood out that you'll never forget? Well, I'll say that uh, I'm, I'm coming from, when I, I left, I was at uh, Providence College for two years and then Rutgers, which at that time was in the Atlantic 10 for one. So I was a high school coach for one and then a college assistant for three. And Stu Jackson hires me right before summer league. Mm -hmm. um, in the first year I was there. So I go to summer league and I, uh, the other assistants are Ernie Grunfeld, who obviously, mm. you know, Brendan well, yeah. and Paul <laughs> Silas. Okay. Um, I get there late. I mean, the, the day of practice, not, you know, we're pre-practice because I just got married. Right. So I got married and I go there immediately. So I get there and I get there for the first practice and I'm, I'm younger than some of the, some of the players, right? I'm 27 or 26, whatever I was. <laughs> I watched the, you know, I'm, I'm coaching in the practice and after practice, you know, because staffs were so small, it's just three assistants and Stu Jackson, the head coach. Stu says to me, now this is the first NBA, anything I've ever seen, right? Other than games on TV, but, and I'm like, he goes, what'd you think? I said, oh, these guys are incredible. <laughs> like we had Eddie Lee Wilkins, right? And I'm like, this guy scored every time, right? And I'm like, these guys are amazing. And and Stu looked at me and 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 Paul Silas and Ernie, they all looked at me like, are you nuts? These guys suck. And I'm like, <laughs> these guys suck? So then we get, you know, fast forward, practice starts in October, right? And back then, you guys remember, the level of contact was insane. So yeah. I'm watching Ewing in the first practice getting beaten to a pulp by his own guys. And he's scoring at will. And I'm like, this dude's hitting 17. I've never seen a guy take a 17 foot turnaround. Like, and then Mark Jackson's throwing like these passes that I couldn't even see as a coach, let alone try to complete in an NBA. I, I was just, astounded how good we were and we ended up that year we were the fifth seeded team in the eastern conference and i say to you that that team because we had ewing in his prime oakley in his prime jackson in his prime uh we traded for maurice cheeks who's a hall of famer uh Ooh. john like i i guarantee even though that was a fifth seeded team that team could have competed like, like literally with anybody. I mean, it was just right. the talent in the league at that time. I know people rave about the skill now, and it is. It's great. Skill's great. But I would never want to diminish, like, my first NBA season because I learned a lot, but I also learned just how great you have to be to be an NBA player. I don't care if you get in in a regular rotation or not. You're a great player. Right. Hey, Coach, I, I want to talk about, you know, stay on New York a little bit. A favorite New York memories, Coach, and I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. I, I know, you know, I, I was I was a little young for when Starks went baseline and, <laughs> and, and, and dunked out, but I, I remember the highlight. But I remember Larry Johnson. It was, he, I forget who you guys were playing. Grandmama hit a four-point play. And, and I Pacers. lost it. Yeah, And I remember... Everybody's going nuts. The teammates are excited. He looked over. I forget who he looked at, and he gave him the, hey, calm down. I got to hit the free throw now. But I, I, one of my favorite basketball memories ever. I'm sure Brendan uh, is with it, too. Yeah, that, that was against Indiana uh, when we went to the finals in 99, and the guy who calmed him down was Chris Childs, which is, is crazy that Chris Childs was calming anyone down because he was <laughs> highly flammable himself. Like, you know – he got in a, a fight with Kobe, like threw punches. You know, this guy was like, he was tough. So, but yeah, but Larry Johnson, I'm, I'm going to tell you, um, we traded uh, Anthony Mason for uh, Larry Johnson. And Larry uh, 
came to us and it, it really shows you um, as a coach, or it's a great reminder as a coach that you never know until you coach them. Because mm. when we got him, someone from the Charlotte organization that I knew well called me and said, you have no idea what you're getting in Larry Johnson. And he went on to like kill this guy. Right. And I'm like, okay. Um, so I have my first meeting with Larry. I love him. Like I love him, but I said, you know, you can be conned by, you know, any player or any coach, you know, that you only deal with, you know, real quickly. And then we start practicing and like, he's unbelievable. Like as far as team sacrifice could really guard, he didn't, you know, his back had started to bother him, you know, that's why they traded him. So he wasn't as explosive, but I'm telling you, he's one of the fav my favorite guys I ever coached. I, I, this guy was like a great, great teammate. The good of the team didn't really care about numbers. I know everybody says that, but we all know everybody cares about numbers for the most part, but Larry yeah. didn't. And in that particular case, you know, Ewing had gone out. Uh, he was out for the rest of the season. Uh, and Larry was an incredible high pressure player. Like he, he came through in playoffs. And so he makes the four point play. We end up winning that game. Uh, two games later in game six uh, in Indiana, I'm sorry, game five in Indiana, he makes two threes down the stretch to win that game. I mean, this guy came through in big time moments. And I'll tell you what, the garden has never, ever, ever been as loud as it was when he made that four point play. Truly a special play that will live in all true Nick fans for the rest of their lives. For sure. For sure, definitely. That's that's why as soon as Ryan brought it up, I knew exactly. We, oh, that's the Pacer game. That's the Pacer game because I was a Nick fan growing up as a kid. Um, now you had obviously a lot of success in New York, but then you 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 were, you were kind of blessed, coach, because you got to coach a lot of really good big men. You got to coach an incredible big man in Houston in Yao Ming. What was that like with the language barrier at first? Yao coming into the game young because hey, look. Injuries really slowed down. Yeah, he was a supremely tough guard back in the day. Like, like it was really hard to guard Yao Ming. But people don't, and, and you had to guard him, Brendan. So like, you know, right? Like people don't realize just how big he was. Right. Like, I mean, and I'm not just talking size. I'm talking like physical. His legs. Legs, like lower body strength. Um, amazing. And combine that with, dexterity and skill um but you're right i was absolutely blessed to have ewing in new york for basically the entirety of my time in new york and then go and uh be able to coach yao i think the thing that stood out with yao um early on i didn't have him as rookie year but i had him as second through you know fifth year uh rudy tomjanovich the great rocket coach who's getting inducted into the hall of fame uh yes. this weekend he said, he put it perfectly. He said, Yao speaks perfect basketball. And that's really true. Mm. Early on, you know, we had an interpreter and um, we had a UN style. So that guy sat away and Yao played, had an earpiece in. Um, but once you got on the court, there was no problems communicating. Um, his, the intangible he had is, he really did enjoy other people's success as much as he did his own. He truly could be happy after a win if somebody else had a big night mm -hmm. and maybe it wasn't his best night. I thought that gave him great joy in playing. He is the single hardest worker I've ever seen in basketball. You know, mm -hmm. now you have everybody wow. promoting everything they do. If, they, if, if an NBA player goes in the gym in the offseason – we have to take a video of it. Like, what the hell else is it supposed to be doing than working out? And, and now it's not called a workout. It's called, I'm in the lab. Okay. Yeah. Enough of it. Enough of it. Putting in okay. work in the lab, coach. Got to do it. Do it I mean, the ground. I mean, please. But no one, quote, worked in the lab more than wow. Yao Ming. And I'll, wow. I'll say this. He was seven foot five or six, whatever you want to say. And he played at 305 pounds, which was like 4% body fat. And the work ethic he and Tom Thibodeau uh, went through on a daily basis and then team practice and then the weightlifting 
it was an everyday commitment to wow. greatness. And I'll say this, at that point, back when Yao played, you know, Shaq was clearly the best center in the league. But the second best center was Yao, and he was closer to Shaq than Dwight Howard, who was the third best center at that time, was to Yao. I mean, Yao obliterated Dwight Howard, you know, regularly. And we all know, you know, Dwight Howard's had a Hall of Fame career. So yes. um, I, I think people forget they have amnesia about how good Yao was. Hey, Coach, I got a quick follow-up question on that because I'm, I'm going to give you, either you or somebody on your staff, your flowers, because you guys had this play that to this day still torments me with Yao Ming. See, <laughs> I, could, I got to the point where I kind of knew if I forced him baseline and kept him off his hook shot that I could time up his jumper because I, I had length. But then you guys had this play where Tracy McGrady was coming off a pick and roll and getting to his left hand. And Lewis Scola was slipping down the lane the other side. And back then, people didn't switch pick and rolls. So I had to come off of Yao's body where I could no longer time it. And man, he would just duck in the lane as big as I don't know what. And there was nothing I could do. I mean, you guys got a bucket every time you ran it. I'm glad you didn't run it more. <laughs> But that play to this day still torment. Whose play was that? I, I think they named it Haywood. Yeah, they probably did name it Haywood because every time they ran it, I could I couldn't stop <laughs> it because if you came off Yao's body and you had to, he scored. If you stayed with him, Lewis Scola went straight to the basket and you couldn't switch it because you didn't have a big in the league that could yep. stay with Tracy McGrady. Yeah. Well, any play that starts with McGrady is a good play. So that <laughs> that you know. Um, but I, I would say this. That 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 that's a Rick Adelman play because I didn't ever mm. get that was Rick's first year was Scola's first year. So Rick, after I got let go, Rick came in and now we all know what a great offensive uh, genius he was. So I'm going to give mm -hmm. him props for that play. But I think what you're talking about even more so, Brendan, is Yao's duck in. Like oh, Yao's duck in, crazy was well timed. He he learned to really post deep, and and you're right because switching. It wasn't used, but also Scola would have obliterated a, you know, a smaller yeah. guy in the post on the switch that you had to, as a five man, come off and, and for a count, play both. You could because Yao was just, he, he was just too good. And McGrady, you know, I, I read all the time about all these passers as forwards, you know, the greatest of all time. And two people, they always leave out in the discussion of greatest passing forwards is McGrady and uh -huh. Rick Barry. And uh -huh. it's crazy. Like people, this, I, this whole, this whole McGrady thing, because again, it goes back to um, how far you go in the playoffs. A lot of times people try to make that about an individual player, but it's, a, it, it's more so about like who are you playing with and who you're playing against. Right. I mean, Chris Paul has never advanced uh, to a conference. Well, no, he, he was in one conference with Harden, final. With Harden. Yeah, with Harden, right? Um, and then got hurt. But it's it's like people like when they talk about McGrady, they they miss the boat on how great he was because I'll say this: McGrady was a really good, really really good regular season player. He was incredible in the playoffs. He's one of those few players that actually played better in the playoffs than he did in the regular season. I always kid McGrady back to back in Milwaukee in the winter. I'm not sure what we're getting out of it, him that night, <laughs> but playoffs with another great team and, and we needed him to be at his best. We were getting a great performance. I mean, he, he, that's how talented he was skilled, talented, smart. Um, you know, what a player. You ain't got to convince me, coach. I always, one of my best friends in the league is Jerry Jeffries, and I always joke about him. I'm like, hey, man, remember that one game when you held Tracy McGrady to 62? <laughs> we, we saw that 62 live and in person, and not only did Tracy McGrady have 62, he missed like eight or nine free throws. So he, he really, if you check the stats, he should have had 70 that night against the Wizards. So I've seen Tracy McGrady at his best live and in person. Listen, hey, if, hey. You, if you put McGrady in the fast-paced game today, Oh with the God. five out spacing and how how the game's officiated, there is no question. I believe that Tracy McGrady would have gotten seventy in a game 
75, like with as many possessions as there are today. I mean, think back, Brendan, the game you're talking about, slower paced, uh, you know, more physical and less shooting on the floor to give you space. I mean, McGrady, think about it. When when I coached him in New York, Jawan Howard was a starting small uh, power forward and he was, you know, a 17 foot shooter. He wasn't a three point shooter. You had Yao, right? And we had okay shooting around McGrady. There was there wasn't nearly the space there on the floor there is today. So I agree with you, McGrady. There's no question, like this idea, like who's who's going to lead the league in scoring? Is it Curry or Beal? Whoever it is, right? McGrady would have been in that discussion every year. Coach, real quick, I hate to backtrack, but we didn't talk about the 13 points in 13 seconds for T Mac. How does that happen? What, like, walk me through, like, how, like, what the heck? Happened there, Coach. Walk me through that, please. First of all, we had been awful the whole game. And so we found ourselves down. And and San Antonio at that time was the premier defensive uh, team in the league. And then so we're down and, you know, we're playing the foul game and trying to press. And, you know, you guys know it, it rarely works. Right. But on this case, McGrady is going against Bruce Bowen, who at that time is the premier defender. and he. He is scoring over Bruce Bowen with Tim Duncan coming to help. He's getting four-point plays off shot bait, lean in. I mean, and then we're down two, and they throw it into the coffin corner from the side out of bounds, and we it, going towards the basket. And we strip Devin Brown, right? Name from the past, blast from the past. Yeah. yeah. So most guys, like McGrady's coming down with the ball in the open court. You think he's going to go to the rim, tie it up, right, or try to? This dude pulls from, like, four-point land. Like, and it just bottom. I'm like, and I, I got to say, they threw it into Parker. He had to take a long shot. Like, you know, I was stunned. Like, you're very rarely stunned after a game. Right. I was absolutely stunned after the game. McGrady always gets on me, though. He said, I don't remember it, but he, he said, I went off to the game about like how, how poorly we had played what? and not to be sucked into the hype of what McGrady had just done. So that again tells you about the differences in the league. Now you like, you would be charged with uh, um, uh, abuse if you had told the team you were unhappy with their performance after a win. So yeah, McGrady gets on me about that all the time. <laughs> but as far as McGrady, like, Kobe, he didn't guard uh, Kobe that often because we had Battier um, for some of that time. And Battier, you know, was really a, a, a good defender. But the one thing I would say is, like, when you have greatness going against greatness, sometimes as a coach, you get in the way, you know, because you're you're trying to, like, keep your guy out of foul trouble. So you put somebody else on. Him. <laughs> it should be mandatory by rule. That at the same position, greatness must guard other greatness. <laughs> so yeah. fans get their the money's worth. And when they did, they were good friends. I I, I don't know was was Kobe Adidas because I I know McGrady he was. was. I'm not early, he was Adidas early in his career, and then he, was, then he went to Nike. Okay, so he was yeah. And so I think there was a bond, a little friendship there. I'm not really sure, but it seemed like it. But when they got on the court, um, they went at each other. I just remember one time. You know, Kobe got us a lot, but McGrady, we were in overtime once, and he and he got it right to the rack um, against the Lakers for like a bucket at point one on the clock. And I'm gonna tell you, as a player, I gotta think that means more uh, when you go against an all-time great like Bryant and are able to come out on top. Now, coach, obviously you transitioned from coaching. Now you're killing it. You're crushing it in the media game. So I'm going to ask you some questions about, about today's game and what you see, because you, you've already given us some gems about Tracy McGrady and what he would have meant offensively. But in, today, in today's game, when you look at where guys like LeBron and Kevin Durant are, I always say, me and Ryan always say the wing is king. And like these wing players just kind of dominate. Do you think we'll see outside a, a point guard situation again like we saw with Steph where point guards can be the best player on a team and win a championship 
Because it's been really hard for point guards to do that in today's game. As much as we like to talk about it's a guard game, to me it seems like more of a wing game. Am I, am I tripping or do you see that as well? No, I mean, I think, you know, I think Kevin Durant and LeBron have been so dominant for so long, right? It's going to be hard to, um, you know, I mean, their greatness can't be overstated. Mm. But I think Harden as a point guard could be the best player on a championship team. You know, we've seen Curry uh, have, has done it um, uh, as the best player on a championship team. I do think, though, that you're, it's not going to be a traditional, like what we think of as a point guard, like a pass first guy. I think you need a dynamic scorer uh, as your best player, someone who um, contorts the defense and the game plan of the other team to open up opportunities for complementary players so um you know to Durant to me like I, I don't know about you guys I'm just mesmerized when I watch him play like he can be out like six weeks hamstring oh I'm gonna come <laughs> back I'm gonna come off the bench and I'm gonna get 30 and it's gonna be easy like right. and I'm like how, how does this guy make it you know look so easy but I, I want to say this one thing about Durant my first year in uh Houston we had training camp I mean on my second year at Houston we had training camp at uh, University of Texas in their practice facility that was Durant's freshman year but I didn't know anything about it right so we go and we're going to our first practice uh, and it's like at 10 in the morning and we get there at let's say nine right and the skinny guy's on the court and he's working out and I'm like like I'm not talking working out. I'm talking like killing himself with a coach. So like, you know, as an NBA player, as an NBA coach, you, you notice because he's obviously big and he, he's obviously skilled, but you're not really thinking about that as you're going into your first practice. So, so we practice for, you know, two, two and a half hours, whatever it is. And he's there the whole time watching. Then we, we're getting, we're leaving to go eat and, and rest and then come back for a second. And he's back on the court, all right? Mm. So now we come back, let's say, at 4 for a 5 o'clock practice. He's working out. So I've seen him work out before our practice, after our practice, before our next practice. We practice, he's still there. And then he's coming back on the court again after that practice. Now, we were there a week, and he was he did the same thing the whole week. Wow. This was before they had started team practice themselves. First of all, I'm like, does this dude ever go to class? <laughs> hey, man, you're going to get Rick Barnes in trouble with the NCAA, man. There's no, there's no way you were completing a college course load if he was in the gym ever. <laughs> and, and secondly, I saw where he was in the classroom. This guy, like that week, I'll never forget because I loved our team. But I was watching, like, in brief glimpses, though, the drive that it takes to be an all-time great. And so – when he scores that easily now, I got to say, it's it's incredible, but I saw the seeds of that through his work ethic way back when he was a freshman at Texas. It, it was wow. truly um, something uh, that stood out then and even stands out today because of what a great, great career he's carved out for himself. Uh, hey, Coach, we're not going to take too much too, up too much more of your time, but I wanted to ask you this question before we let you go. Um, obviously, the game's in great hands. We have a lot of great players in this league. But what young player do you see coming up that could be the face of the league when LeBron steps away? He's 36 years old. I, I think Kevin Durant's going to have a run, but he's in his, he's in his uh, early 30s as well. What guy coming up underneath those guys you think, like, yeah, in about four or five years, this is going to be the guy that's on all the commercials that, that, that the NBA really builds its franchise around. You know, that's such a hard question for me, uh, Brendan, because to, to be great mm. and be thought of in that way, you have to win big. And I don't know, like with a, like, I'll give you a, for example, Carl Anthony Towns has made the, Everybody would say he's a very, very talented offensive player, yeah. right? But he has been stuck in, other than one year he made the playoffs when Jimmy Butler was the best player on the team, they've been stuck in, in mediocrity or even worse, you know? And 
So you're never going to get the credit for how good you are when you're in a perpetually losing situation. I think the guy that I think has done the most for himself over the last year is Devin Booker. I think, you know, he had been stuck in a very bad situation in Phoenix. Then they hire Monty Williams. They go eight and zero in the bubble. Uh, They have a great year this year. They trade for Chris Paul. They win a lot more. And I think now everybody, uh, even casual basketball fans are like Devin Booker. He's a problem. And he is. And so I think you have to figure out who's going to not just be put up numbers, but who's going to put up numbers in significant games and win at a high level. Um, I point to a guy like Booker, um, you know, who's also really good. Like, I, like, again, I, I don't watch, I can't watch every team every night, but when I watch him, I'm like, dang, this guy is good. Zach Levine. I watch yes. Zach Levine. Yes. And I'm like, but again, lottery teams in Minnesota, lottery teams in, in Chicago. But if he ever gets like winning, I think people are going to notice this guy scores easily. And I'll tell you the final part of that for me, Brendan, is of those of those guys you're talking about, who really commits to the defensive end of the floor? Mm-hmm. Because that's how you win. Like you you take an ultra talented offensive player and he commits to doing the hard things that help you win, like play defense, like pass the ball uh, when he draws the second defender, like get in skirmishes for long rebounds and loose balls. And I think. When I watch Booker this year, Booker has taken strides to try to do the hard things that lead to winning, plus put up impressive numbers. And so um, I, that's what I'm looking for out of those young guys. But man, am I like, like I'm taken aback sometimes by how easily some of these guys score. Coach, this is a this is one of our final questions, man. We always like to have a little fun, man. You'll you'll enjoy this, so just just bear with us, man. We're, we're used to the former players on here, man, but you you you're, you're an unofficial former player, coach. You just one at the league level, man. One at the league level. <laughs> um, we like to say this is. <laughs> we like to say this is our club story, or better yet, the all moment. You know, I was in Minnesota. And Prince came to the club one time after the game. You know, Brendan had a, a run in with Mike Tyson before. You know, Sean Marion had a dance with Janet Jackson, you know, that stood out. You know, Deion Sanders talked about being a young rookie in the club and he looks to his left and Magic Johnson's there. And then, you know, I don't know if it was Kareem or someone else on his left and right. You know, it was we there know, either. We know Coach Coach Van Gundy's not going to have a club store. We know. You never, who knows, man? Hey, you never know. You never know. <laughs> but no, it, no, no. Listen, better yet, listen, they wouldn't even let me in the club. Look at me. Like, <laughs> come on. But I'm going to. In all moment, this. in all moment, like, am I really here with yeah. these? Like, wow. Well, mine takes place like when I was young, I was six. And my dad, like I said, was coaching um, small college. And back then, Final Four tickets, we were, I, I was growing up in Northern California. Final Four tickets weren't um, as hard to get as they were now. So um, I went to my first Final Four, okay? It was 1969. It was the rematch of uh, Houston and UCLA. El- Elvin Hayes had beaten Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then Lou Alcindor in the Astrodome, the largest uh, – crowd ever at a game Jabbar was playing with a scratch cornea they they we go to the final four and we're allowed to you know back then you know there was not the security it was just different right so I think they played the second game so my dad I asked with my brother can I go and and go to the escalator where the players came into the old LA sports arena Mm -hmm. and they were, they were taking that escalator. I don't know if you guys remember if, or if you ever played there, but the escalator down. And I was at the escalator. And Jabbar comes by with all of UCLA. I think I'm the only kid there. And he palms my head. And his fingers come all the way down my face. I, I, I was like, this is the, the, the greatest day of my life. That was my awe moment. 
Now here's the real long moment. I'm coaching and I'm walking down the, you know, the Staples Center, like, you know, that um, where the, the ramp. cars go down. I was going, walking down that ramp. He happens to be walking down. I get off the bus for the Rockets. He's there. I go up and tell him my awe moment. The guy couldn't have been any less interested. He looked at me <laughs> like, first of all, I don't even know who you are. Second of all, do you care? Don't you think I care what happened to you when you were six? If I had an awe moment, that was my crushing moment. I was trying to pour my heart out to him, but <laughs> not happening. Coach, Coach Kareem made that type of guy. Trust me, I, I've, I've lived that as well. I talked to you about that in another day. <laughs> anyway, Coach, we appreciate having you on. Thank you very much for giving us some of your time. You were excellent. Appreciate it once again. Absolutely, hey. guys. Good luck with your uh, media. Your guys are doing great in your media career. So congratulations uh, for all your successes. Hey, 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 we appreciate you, Coach Spanks, for coming on. And, and real quick, you, you kind of ruined my first time calling a game because I thought I was Jeff Van Gundy. And they told me to stop cracking jokes, you know, give some analysis. I, I, I thought I was you, man. It, it didn't work out. I had to refine my skills. But appreciate you for coming on, Coach, and keep doing a great job because guys like myself and Brendan, we watch, we admire, and we we take in and we, we you know, we, we grow with watching you. All right. Take care. Best of luck. Thank you. This is Jeff Van Gundy hanging out with the opinionated seven-footers. Great show. Great posts.